Tonight, a Citrus TV News special report. A year after not again as news calls for change capture the attention of campus, we're back where it all began. Plus, I'm here outside Cross Hines Hall where hashtag not again SU protests broke out last spring. And not again SU came just before a wave of racial injustice protests across the nation this past summer and right here in Syracuse. The Citrus TV News Not Again SU special report starts right now. A racial slur written in a day hole bathroom. Students have been sitting in at the Barnes Center. It really makes us feel like we don't like we don't belong. The hashtag Not Again SU movement is currently occupying Kraus Heinz Hall. The administration has informed the student body that negotiations have concluded. It's clear that we haven't finished thoroughly going over every demand. One year ago today, protests broke out at Syracuse University. The movement called hashtag not again SU would go on to change student life on campus. Good evening, I'm Greg Bradbury. Not again SU began as several bias related incidents were reported on campus. Racist graffiti in Day Hall was the first and by the end of November, at least 11 more bias related incidents had taken place. We want to go right now to Citrus TV reporter Ricky Sayer to take a look back at the hashtag not again as you protest. Ricky is at the Barnes Center where it all began. Ricky. I want to take everyone back to a year ago after that initial incident at Day Hall. Marginalized communities here on campus began mobilizing, determined to take a stand against the university. They came here to the Barnes Center because of all the people who walk through here every day. They told us they had no set plan, no idea how long they'd occupy. It lasted more than a week in the midst attracting attention from across the country. The protesters were calling on SU to take responsibility for creating an environment that is harmful to minorities and to take steps to improve that environment. On that first Wednesday of the sit-in, they came up with a list of demands. We'll tell you about more about those in a moment. Back on that first Wednesday, there was a multi-hour long Q&A between protesters and students. It grew very heated at times. Students bearing their feelings, trying to get through to administrators. For their part, the administrators did respond, making some commitments on the spot. The protesters, however, called for tangible action. They said that they didn't see it by November 20th, that they would call for the chancellor's resignation. Protesters stayed overnight, risking sanctions. By Friday, the chancellor had made a second visit to the Barnes Center, responding to each of the protesters' demands. Later that day, protesters expanded on their demands. Saturday brought high-profile visitors, the mayor and assemblyman, basketball coach Jim Beheim even making an appearance, where protesters confronted him over his past statements. In the following days, the chancellor responded again, saying they could meet most, but not all of the demands. The protests appeared to come to a head Wednesday night during a forum at Hendricks Chapel where protesters rejected the chancellor's response. Again, they asked him to agree to everything on the spot. Again, he said no, and protesters stormed out of the building, chanting sign or resign as they went to the chancellor's residence. Later that night, the chancellor signed 16 out of 19 demands fully, making revisions to the rest. On Thursday, the protesters deoccupied ahead of Thanksgiving break, but making clear they rejected the chancellor's revisions and would officially call for his resignation. They followed through on that promise weeks later, officially delivering letters to the university, calling for resignations. When not again as you left the Barnes Center, it wasn't clear whether or not they would have staying power or fizzle out as some past movements have. But as we saw in the spring, not again as you was here to stay. Reporting here outside of the Barnes Center, Ricky Sayer, Citrus TV News. Those demands that Ricky mentioned covered a wide range of issues on the SU campus, many of them the university has been working on. Some still remain incomplete. That was the moment protesters stormed out of a forum with the chancellor, calling for him to sign the demands or resign. The university did end up signing the demands and now 16 of the 19 the university considers to be completed. Some of those completed include allocating $1 million for SEM 100 training in the 2021 fiscal year, hiring four counselors of color, revising the student code of conduct for those who commit bias-related incidents, and creating a website that keeps track of bias-related incidents. The university is still working to complete three of the fall demands. Those are reforming SEM 100 classes for first-year students, building a multicultural office. Right now, the university is considering the building at 119 Euclid Avenue, and making public tenured faculty diversity training progress. The university says they will do this to the extent of the law, 
and it is still in progress. Not Again SU protests sparked up again in the spring. Citrus TV's Carmela Boykin is outside of Kraus Heinz Hall, where the second round of protests took place. Carmela? That's right, Greg. The group began occupying Kraus Heinz Hall just through these doors behind me in February of last year, the sit-in lasting for 31 days. And as that progressed, Not Again SU updated their demands to include resources for students struggling financially as well as for students with disabilities. Their updated list of 18 demands also called for the resignations of Chancellor Kent Siverud, Senior Vice President for Enrollment and the Student Experience, Dolan Ivanovich, DPS Chief Robert Maldonado, and Deputy Chief John Sardino. During the month-long occupation, protesters, administrators, and DPS clashed over access to food and use of force. SU officials later admitting they did, in fact, deny food access to Kraus Heinz during the negotiations. SU staff and faculty members supported students throughout the protest. Over 100 teaching assistants even went on strike in solidarity with the organization. On March 5th, over 70 faculty members participated in a class walkout organized by the Faculty Action Collective. On March 10th, university officials released a statement agreeing to multiple of the updated demands. They refused several, though, including the disarming of DPS officers, as well as the resignations of SU's leaders. Protesters and SU faculty criticized the statement, claiming the administration had shown a lack of progress on certain initiatives. Now, it's hard to determine whether the sit-in would have continued beyond the 31 days. The occupancy here at Kraus Heinz ultimately ended when the university canceled residential learning due to the COVID-19 pandemic, leaving behind the unmet Nottingham SU demands. Carmela Boykin, Citrus TV News. Thanks, Carmela. As it stands on the spring demands, six of them are completed and five of them remain in progress. As for the others, the university did not completely agree to them. One, for instance, called for the identity of students who commit bias-related incidents to be released. Well, legally, the university cannot do that. You can read all of the updates on SU's Diversity and Inclusion Commitments webpage. Now, as the university works on the demands, Not Again SU is still working to create change. Citrus TV reporter Ricky Sayer spoke to Not Again SU organizers to get an update on where the movement stands one year later. So we've shifted towards a more virtual activism approach just because of the pandemic mainly, and also because we're still transitioning from having our prior organizing space um, to a now more, um, I guess like lower level undergraduate space just because most of the organizers were seniors in the past. And, and given that they've graduated, we're kind of trying to figure out um, like reassigning roles and stuff like that. Sure. Had it not been for the pandemic, could not again SU have continued their occupation past spring break? Yes. That that would have been the plan. Yes. Would, would the plan have been to be there until the university fully agrees to the demands? Yes. Mm -hmm. So what's the overall legacy that you hope? not again as you has left thus far yeah i think we hope to uh allow people to question the institutions that they attend um and their policies and and who's in charge um who's making the rules who are the rules for um who are they protecting uh that, that those sort of questions that get that get people going um and and we hope to leave the the legacy of like you you have more power than than people want you to believe than SU admin wants you to believe and, and we hope that other students if they feel that they need to speak up they start speaking up immediately anything and yeah to quickly branch off that again i think it's kind of early to talk about legacies for not again su um although we're an extension of other um protesting and protesting groups on campus i think not again su is still fairly new like you said it's like the one-year anniversary and there's so much more work that has to be done um a lot of not again SU organizers are underclassmen and they still have their whole college experience to go through. Um, so I think legacy is a really thing to talk, really strange thing to talk about because in the context of not again SU, we're fairly new and like we are just getting started and what's all last year and last semester are just is really just our foundational work. Um, and we have so much more to come and we're looking forward to prioritizing uh, marginalized bodies and people on campus because so so often um, in institutions like Syracuse 
they are erased and nullified and made invisible. The newly revamped SEM 100 class has wrapped up for the semester. The Not Again SU demands created many changes for the required first year course. Citrus TV's Yaban Su takes us through what the first year's experience was. After the hashtag Not Again SU protest erupted last year, one demand that was made and granted was changes to the SEM 100 curriculum. Course developer Dr. Shandys Hayes Jackson says the changes began with the faculty. But we also looked at staff members who had training and expertise in those areas as well too, and really made an effort to to get the the highest of the higher, the cream of the crop of facilitators, uh, lead facilitators in particular, in this iteration. Other changes included a diverse assortment of students to act as peer facilitators, media that sparked more conversation, and instead of books smaller readings that related back to class concepts. Citrus TV spoke with Olivia Fowler and Hannah Wright to discuss how this new Sum 100 class has worked out for them. No one turned on their camera, which meant no one would really participate. And so it was a lot of silence or like the teacher kind of continuing to ramble. It's more than anything, I feel like I learned most from other students' opinions and their life experiences more than the course itself. After having the course changes explained to them, both Hannah and Liv noted how the changes didn't really carry over to their class. Only about like three videos shown throughout the whole um, time that we were in class. I think it helped me in the sense that like I could recap the class and like go over subjects, but I did not take much time writing them, knowing it was pass fail, and they were kind of. They weren't really organized at all. Thanks, Yao. In June, over 200 students and alumni from SU's Visual and Performing Arts Drama Department signed a letter calling out pervasive institutional racism. The group issued a series of demands intended to make SU drama more equitable, especially for black students who felt tokenized and underrepresented. After months of negotiation, drama dean Ralph Zito agreed to the demands in October. Students and alumni say the movement was inspired by Not Again SU. It's really overwhelming to witness everything that's happened. Um, so just to sort of try to digest the racist history of our country, but something that we do have control over are the institutions that we were a part of or are a part of. And so it made, I think, want to do something about the things we did have control over and speak up about it. Pre-selected studio classes will be removed. Zito says they will also bring in hairstyling options for black students. The department says they will ensure black students are given the opportunity to play three-dimensional black characters written by black playwrights. The drama department says they will work with the Office of Enrollment so more students of color can join the program. The goal is currently 40%. And social injustice isn't only seen at SU, it can be seen and found all around the city of Syracuse and throughout the nation. Citrus TV's Katie Lane spoke with one student activist who spent much of his teenage years with the Black Lives Matter movement and his college years with Not Again SU. Friday, November 13th. The Syracuse University campus is eerily quiet as classes have transitioned online for the rest of the semester. But just one year ago today, students weren't standing six feet apart. They were arm in arm, protesting a slew of racist incidents on campus, staging a sit-in, and the Not Again SU movement was born. The campus and a lot of my friends here were really tired of everything going on. We are like, we're tired of this. We want something to change. We want the school to take responsibility. Bryson Greco was a sophomore when the Not Again SU protests began, but he was no stranger to fighting for his rights. Bryson has been a social rights activist since he was in high school. I'm a senior rep at Regional, uh, looking at Hopeful, and I concern you. Not when it comes to my grades, sorry mom, but when it comes to social justice. It's the social injustice that he says is structural. Even in the city he now calls home, a city that's one of the top 10 worst places for black Americans. The school is like an ivory tower compared to the rest of the city. It sits at like the top of the hill, and this is like the definition of money and power looking down over the rest of the city. Over the summer, Syracuse residents joined the fight against social injustice, taking part in the National Black Lives Matter movement. Over 2,000 community members marched to City Hall 
where they protest police brutality and the death of George Floyd. It's about changing the infrastructure of stuff. And you young people that's out here now, you got to start using your votes. Bryson says the way people have come together and the dialogue that has been created in both the Not Again SU movement and the Black Lives Matter movement is one that will help make a lasting change. It's a systematic thing, but this is a people thing. It's like if the system is broken, we can fix the system. But if people don't agree, then fixing the system won't do anything. Katie Lane, Citrus TV News. Thanks, Katie. Since students returned to campus this semester, there have been two bias-related incidents at SU. Looking ahead to next semester, the university is still working on meeting, not again SU's demands. Citrus TV News will keep you updated with those as we learn more. Also next spring, be sure to tune in to our hour-long Not Again SU special, where we will take a deeper dive into a pivotal time at SU. For all of us at Citrus TV News, I'm Greg Bradbury. Have a great night.